Okay. Oh, the other thing, of course, to mention, you probably already saw on the program, but tonight we have the reception uh, in the area here. So I think we've got it down to six. There'll be some drinks and snacks uh, and food from six uh, onwards tonight. So we can all get to um, know each other a little bit more, a little bit of an icebreaker. Okay. So what I want to do now for the next hour is I'm going to almost take a step back. Uh, this is going to be a very basic introduction to forecast systems and their setup, okay? So in a way, it's almost a, a kind of, um, how do you say, uh, a pre-introduction to some of the things that Frederick was introducing this morning. It does mean that for some people in the room, it might be a little bit of repetition. You probably, some people will know some of the things I'm showing, but I think it's important at the beginning to show some really basic framework uh, material to make sure that we all start on the same page from tomorrow, especially when we start to look at the databases, because uh, if, if you don't have a familiarity with these systems, sometimes when we talk about hindcasts on the fly, fixed, not fixed, it can be a little bit confusing with all these different setups. So this is going to be very basic, and I apologize in advance for those people in the room that have more of an understanding, and so um, this will be a little bit of repetition. Um, I'm a native speaker, as you probably noticed, uh, and I sometimes speak too quickly. I will try and keep slow and clear. If I get too fast, because I get excited sometimes, as you saw this morning, put your hand up and slow me down, okay? I tell my diploma students to do the same, because they're used to me now, and uh, so you sometimes don't be afraid say, Tompkins, calm, deep breath, slow down, okay? Uh, I already talked about some of our programs, but I've left the slide in, so it will be on there for reference as well, for shortcuts about some of our programs and some of the things that we do. So Frederick already showed a plot like this this morning, but I'm going to start there again just to emphasize where we are. So this is one of these, if you Google, you find a hundred different million versions of this kind of chart. They use them in all sorts of fields. You find them for ecology. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, evolutionary plant studies have them. They, they, they run from paleo climate and so on. This is one that's applicable for our field, for meteorology. So we have a, a spatial scale across the X and a time scale across the Y. Okay. And so essentially what the chart is showing is, is different kinds of, and the, the colors are not showing up very well here, but different kinds of uh, basically phenomenon on the time scale on which they occur. So some of the uh, things I was working on in my own early days were the dynamics of thunderstorms and so on. So the point we have to remember, and Frederick uh, already mentioned that in passing quickly this morning, is that all of these with their time scales are associated with a time scale of predictability as well. So, for example, for evolution of thunderstorms, we're really talking about short time scales and now casting. So when I'm on my bike, like this morning, and I want to cycle home, uh, what do I do is I look at if it's, I mean, it doesn't rain so often in Trieste, where I come from in England, but I look at the radar and I use my brain to make a now cast forecast to extrapolate the rain to see when exactly I should leave my office to make sure I don't get wet. That's a forecast. Um, you can also uh, purchase software that does it for you, takes the images, moves them forward in time, and works out when they're going to pass over where you are. And that's now casting. Now, of course, if we start to look at the forecasting systems like ESMWF for the next few days ahead, we're not going to be able to predict where the thunderstorms will occur, even if we have the statistics correct. So if you look at the ESMWF forecast for three days ahead, you can tell if there's going to be a chance of thunderstorms, but we don't know if they're going to arrive here or up the road in Monfalcone, because then all you have is the smaller scale processes essentially are, should we say, stochastic, and you can only predict some of the statistics in the envelope. So if you go up to longer times on the days, you're basically now the larger scales, such as fronts, three days ahead, as Frederick showed very nicely, we can predict the passage of fronts, but the smaller scale phenomena we're only really 
able to predict the statistics. So what is this workshop about? Well, this is these next two tranches, so basically sub-season out to this interface here. So Frederick was talking about some of these phenomena this morning where basically on the month to multiple months time scale, then you can predict larger scale, for example, evolution of planetary waves like in the tropics of Madden Julian oscillation, so large scale waves, but some of the things such as cyclones, you're not going to be able to predict their precise position and evolution and genesis on those longer monthly timescales. So that's, again, why he was picking up these phenomena. So during this week, we are going to have lectures, for example, from Fred Kuchowski uh, introducing the basics of planetary waves. We are going to have lectures on the MGO uh, and moving out towards ENSO uh, because, as Frederick said, we're really concerned with the sub-seasonal out to the borderline season, the first season. Okay. And then, of course, we move beyond that uh, to the decadal initialized prediction, which was the subject of last week's workshop. So if you're interested in that, you're, you're, you're in the wrong week. <laughs> okay. You arrived seven days too late. Okay, so here we go. So as I said, that was just to emphasize what the, the target of the workshop is. Okay. So the things I'm going to very give you a basic uh, overview of are the things that we need to consider. So ensembles, why we need ensembles, initialization and hindcasts, okay? And there's going to be more detailed lectures during the week, so this is only an introduction. So Frederick, for example, is going to talk about forecast initialization in more detail, okay? So that's just an, an overview, and, uh, overview, again, of the aim of, the, of, the, of this school. So to introduce sub-seasonal phenomena, that's in week one, such as the MGO, okay? Give an overview of the NWP systems, that we're going to be using uh, to emphasize the use of the new S2S database, uh, how to uh, look at the web interface. I think we'll show this to you briefly in a demonstration this afternoon, and then tomorrow in the lab uh, we'll be looking at this. Um, and then with Paula, especially in the labs, we're going to be showing you how to uh, retrieve with the, the, the Python uh, scripts. So this enables you to do it from the command line. It gives you a lot more power but it is a little bit more complicated. Um, uh, most of you are, in, in, in are familiar with using a Linux interface, maybe, I think, no? Um, for those of you who have, haven't had that much experience, don't worry, we will go over slowly and we'll have the chance to actually perhaps have some small breakout groups for those that need a little bit more instruction on that. Okay. Uh, Paul is going to introduce the uh, database, as I said, and we'll have a, a little bit of introduction to the reanalysis uh, and era interim in the afternoon, okay? And then week two is the application. So now I'm going to talk about, in particular, uncertainty and how that relates to the way these systems are set up, okay? So as I said, I'm starting from something really basic, okay? So... NWP systems, uh, they're, they're basically made up, underlying these systems are a set of fundamental equations. So we have the equations of motion, equations of state, thermodynamic mass balance and water balance equations. Okay, so um, it's important to realize that these underlying equations are basically derived from first principles and they're well known. Okay. And we solve those equations on a grid. So when we talk about model resolution, what we're essentially doing is we're dividing the atmosphere up into a series of boxes. So we can imagine this room. We want to model the, the atmosphere in this room. We divide it up into a, a grid, a grill. And uh, in each box, uh, we assume that the atmosphere is essentially a, a continuum. And so we have just one number that describes the properties of the atmosphere in that box, such as the temperature, the water vapor, the velocity, and so on. So the key thing to realize is that in each box, these properties are considered to be basically uniform. We neglect the subgrid scale variability in most models. That's not true for all models. One of the, uh, the works I was doing in the ECAM model was to also introduce prognostic predictive equations for higher order moments, such as the variability of the, the water vapor within the boxes, okay? 
And these equations are integrated numerically in forwards in time, okay? Step by step over a time step. So, for example, the Eastern WF system now, the highest resolution is probably using around a 10-minute time step. Is that right? So it's 10-minute time step. So basically, step forward, 10 minutes in time, integrating the thermodynamic and dynamic equations. So how large are these boxes? Well, it depends on your problem. Of course, if you have a global model, then you have to have a lot more boxes to cover your world compared to a, a small-scale regional model. It depends on your, your problem. So if you're only forecasting for the next three days or you're forecasting for the next 10 years, again, that takes computer part time and you'll need to change your, your, your grid box size. When we start to talk about subbles, if you want to have many forecasts, again, it's going to affect the affordability. So these were some of the choices that Frederick was alluding to earlier that we're going to talk in a little bit more detail about. So just to give you some examples from the two extremes, this on the top is showing you the progress of the climate model resolution at the various IPCC reports, starting from the first report right through to, this is the fourth report. I haven't got the fifth report uh, graphic here, but in fact, the resolution between AR4 and AR5 wasn't that uh, much different. There was a small improvement. It tended to be that AR5 increased the ensemble size. So you can see, for example, in Europe, we're starting to resolve the difference between France and Britain. And so, as Frederick's from France, we can make lots of jokes about the English Channel and so on there, but okay. Um, and uh, if we then go to the NWP end, uh, so this is kind of the recent upgrade uh, about, I think, four years ago at ECMWF moved from uh, T799 to 1279 over here. And this is showing how the, I mean, basically the state of the art at a center like ECMWF resolves the, the topography. So most of the S2S systems are kind of sitting in between these ranges, as we said. So Frederick had a table of the resolutions. Uh, the coarsest S2S is here. Uh, the finest S2S is bordering on this kind of resolution on the left. Okay. So what's the issue concerning this finite grid scale? Well, of course, uh, as we said, in each of these boxes, everything's considered uniform. So if we have a box size that's on the order of 50 or 100 kilometers wide, you're not resolving any of the fluctuations that occur on smaller scales. Okay. But of course, we know that the weather that we experience from day to day, thunderstorms and so on, is essentially on scales which are much smaller. So a typical deep thunderstorm updraft span is, I mean, what's the typical size of a, a deep uh, convective updraft? Hmm? Yes, exactly. So on the order of, a, order of magnitude of a kilometer or so. So you've got these fast updrafts on the order of a magnitude of a kilometer. If you really want to resolve the process as well, you have to, for example, the mixing into the updrafts, you need to have resolutions even much finer than that. Otherwise, all of your mixing between the updrafts and the environment is going to be handled anyway by subgrid scale schemes for diffusion and diffusion mixing. Okay. So if you can't afford that, you have to represent these kind of scales of motions in convection, uh, cloud microphysics processes, and the interaction with radiation by essentially what's called parameterizations. So these are small, simplified models that take the information that you know on the large scale, so there might be the vertical stability profile, and uses that to describe the statistics of the small scale that you can't represent. Okay. So a lot of my work at ESMWF was focused on developing those kind of parameterization schemes. How can you represent the statistics of what's going on on the small scale by what you know on the larger scales? And it's very important because what happens on those smaller scales feeds back onto the larger scales. Okay. So just to summarize the kind of things that you have to parameterize, deep convection, shallow convection, uh, cloud microphysics and interaction. And you're never going to get away from this. No matter what resolution, there are always going to be processes such as microphysics that are going to occur on smaller scales. So even using uh, one of my PhD students at the moment, we're looking at uh, convection organization in the tropics with a model using two-kilometer resolutions. 
but the way that the convection organizes is extremely sensitive on the assumptions that you make concerning the subgrid scale mixing, so the parameterizations, even though that's considered to be a cloud resolving model. And it's the same for the ocean. Again, you've got uh, subgrid scale processes that are not represented. Okay. So why am I worried about parameterizations? Well, they're not always derivable from theory. They may contain ad hoc assumptions, uh, particularly to close the equation set. And these parameters might be difficult to measure from observations or to derive from theory. Okay. So the result, uh, which I'm highlighting in red, is model uncertainty. Okay. So a lot of the uncertainty that we attribute to models is not on their fundamental equation set, the equations of motion, and uh, basically the momentum equations, okay? The way that you solve them, there are differences. The way you solve the advection equation is accuracy and its stability. There will be differences between models, but a far greater source of differences between models is often associated with the representation of the physics. So just taking the climate models, for example, cloud parameterization was a big source of differences. This just emphasizes that these are all different models that contributed to the latest IPCC report, for example. And the top line here is showing uh, the, basically the net and the short and the long wave cloud uh, sensitivity. Uh, and then these are the clear sky feedback. So you can see there's a lot of agreement in the clear sky processes. If you look at the cloud, they're all over the place. And this is the result not just of the cloud microphysics, but also the convection, the turbulence processes, shallow, deep, and so on. Uh, the radiation assumptions, the assumptions about cloud particle properties. Okay. So we have basically an uncertain model. So why or how uh, is that going to impact our forecast? So let's imagine in this schematic that we have some state, x of t, and we're trying to predict the future at some time in the future, at x t plus t. So this might be a, a two-week forecast with one of the S2S models, okay? So if the observed state evolved in this way, we might conduct a forecast, and the forecast might diverge over time from the observed state, okay? So what are the reasons why we're going to have this divergence is because we have an imperfect model. Our representation of the physics is not perfect, okay? But we're also going to have a divergence, of course, because there's uncertainty in the initial conditions. So how do we account for that uncertainty? I mean, we can try over the long term to improve our models and try and bring that down. You said the word. I run the ensembles. Okay, so this is why we run many, many forecasts. It's just basically a, a sledgehammer approach to try, and it's, it's one of, basically the only way we, we really know of trying to uh, assess our uncertainty. So rather than simply running a single forecast over the two-week or four-week or two-month period, we run a whole set of uh, forecasts. So we might perturb our initial conditions, okay, and we might perturb our model during the actual forecast. And I'm going to talk about how we do that in, in a second. And the result of that is rather than just one forecast, we'll end up with 50 or 100, depends how big our ensemble size is, uh, a cluster of solutions. Okay. So if we have a very tight cluster of solutions, we might think that we're quite confident about our prediction. Or if we have a very large range in our solutions, and we might think that we're not very confident about our prediction. Okay. But how do we know what that... Well, let's show a couple of examples first before I ask that question. So this is to try and account for both initial condition uncertainty and model uncertainty. Okay. So here's an example just from a recent Nature paper where we start with lots of perturbations in schematically, and these are all different precipitation forecasts for the UK. You can overlay them and put a probability map together of where you think it's the most likely to rain in a certain time in advance. Okay. This is another example uh, uh, back from over a decade ago, but again, it's showing basically three-day forecasts uh, for a severe storm 
in the United States. Uh, I quite like this talk because I was actually there at the time and I got in one day earlier, luckily, because all the airports were closed down and the whole place was snowed off. And it was very poorly predicted. So just three days in advance at the time, you found that basically you can look at different members and some of them had an extremely low pressure system and some of them were basically uh, failing completely to have any kind of uh, prediction uh, at all of the event. So it was very, very sensitive to small perturbations in the initial condition. This is another example on a longer time scale. So this is looking at seasonal predictions three months ahead. So it's on that borderline su uh, sub-seasonal to seasonal uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, and you can see again that you can have huge uncertainty between the different members. So this is just nine members out of a larger ensemble showing uh, predictions for rainfall over Ethiopia three months in advance. So how many of you have seen plots like this? This is a spaghetti plot of, of Nino, okay? Uh, so it's, uh, this is the Nino 3 forecast. Uh, this was done a few months ago. This was back in August, okay? So each of these red lines is, again, one model forecast to the future of the anomaly of the SSTs in the Eastern Pacific. So you can see at the time that most of the models were forecasting an amplification with a peak towards the end of the year and then scaling off. But you can see there's a tremendous variety between these different model integrations. So some of them have the ENSO tailing off straight away. Some of them have a, a very strong amplification. So this is a, an example more close to home. So this is today's forecast of uh, Trieste's weather this week. I thought if everybody was completely asleep by this point, maybe this would wake some of you up at least because uh, it's quite relevant for your week ahead. So on the top, we have precipitation. In the middle, we have wind speed. And on the bottom, we have the two-meter temperature. Okay. So the boxes and whiskers are showing, again, the uncertainty, their statistics about the ensemble for the prediction ahead. So you can see that as the lead time, this is the forecast was made yesterday on Sunday. As we go to the right, time is increasing, so it's looking further and further ahead into the future. So you see what you would expect, that the box whisker size that shows you the uncertainty, so... The, the larger boxes is going from the 25 to the 75 percentile, okay? And then the thinner boxes are going from the 10 to the 90 percent. They're widening as the uncertainty increases the further ahead you go. So you can see that we have a, a borer predicted for tomorrow. It's going to get pretty windy, calms off, and then it gets even stronger towards the end of the week, so Thursday, Friday. So you're going to have a, an experience of a borer, those of you that haven't experienced it before. This is going to be about medium strength, okay? And I'm scaling up here when I say medium strength because the wind speed here is, says eight, but we've got box sizes, which even though this is a world leading center with, you know, on the order of uh, 16 kilometer box sizes, I know from experience that when you downscale this to the very fine topography over Trieste, that I've got to scale this up by a factor of two to three. Uh, to get the true wind speed here, you see. So even then, you have to do some post-processing, which is something else we're going to talk about during the week, uh, uh, kind of post-calibration, which I do in my head. Same as with the temperature. Topography is very complicated. You only have to go in the winter, just up to Alpacino, two or three kilometers away, and it can be seven degrees warmer at night uh, because, again, of the topography holding the cold air over the lip. And then here we're down by the sea. So, again, it's, it's, it's this issue of resolution and not being able to represent those small-scale fluctuations. So I know that uh, uh, this thing tends to be by, so the temperature at the bottom here, um, due to that effect, uh, to the cold side, even though this is adjusted to station height for the location, okay, using a, a lapse rate adjustment. Question? Right, so 
So the deterministic, well, let me answer that a little bit later because I come back to this slide later when I've introduced the different systems of the different ranges. Because uh, if I start to answer the difference between these now, uh, it might confuse some people. I have a slide in a minute where I show the different range systems and then I come back to this. So let me come back to that question in a moment. Okay, so how do we actually introduce these perturbations? Okay, so initial conditions, we could do a variety of things. Okay, we could just apply random perturbations. We can target them. We can even have ensemble data assimilation. So what's the difference between those? Well, if we look at just um, short range, for example, the median range, the idea there is um, one looks at a window, uh, normally of around a range of around two days. Is it still two days now, the targeting for the uh, single vectors? Okay, so 48 hours. Okay, in that 48 hour window, one assumes that the evolution of the dynamics is approximately linear, and then one uses a targeted technique based on singular vectors to try and work out where your perturbations will lead to the most sensitive growth and divergence between the forecasts. Because the idea is, if you're building an ensemble and you only have 50 shots, you don't want all of those 50 forecasts to look exactly the same. Okay. Maybe they might be very similar because the, the atmospheric state is very predictable, but it might just be that you haven't found the locations where it's very sensitive for error growth. Because uh, at the end of the day, butterflies have a very bad reputation. You know, we all seem to think that they're destroying half the world through their flapping of their wings. But usually that doesn't happen. The butterfly really has to be in the wrong place at the wrong time to cause carnage through uh, uh, tropical cyclones and so on. Okay? So the atmosphere will be sensitive in particular locations, depending on the stability. And in others, that butterfly can flap as much as it likes. Those perturbations will just dissipate away. Okay? So you can try and target. That's what we do at ESMWF. That's what ESMWF does. It targets those to try and work out where we need to perturb the atmosphere to have the fastest growth. Now, when you go to longer time scales, we don't really know how to do that yet. So when you look at seasonal forecasts, we don't really know yet, and it's one of the areas that's under kind of active research, how to do the equivalent for a one or a three month forecast. So for S2S systems or so on, or a seasonal forecast system, it tends to be the, the perturbations are just putting randomly. If you ask some people, they will say, well, that's fine anyway. We still have the growth. Do you really want to target? It's not. That's a much more open research question of how you perturb your ensemble to have the right spread over longer time scales. And ESMWF now have introduced a system as well where they have ensemble data assimilation. What does that mean? Well, if we're trying to, I'm going to talk about data assimilation again in a very introductory talk after lunch. But if you want to assimilate information, okay, and you have some sources of information can be quite sparse. You have an observational error attached to different kinds of observations, whether they're station data or satellite. So your data assimilation answer, it's not just one correct answer. You can have a whole set of, should we say, assimilated pictures of the atmosphere that are consistent with the observations that you have. So you might want to try and incorporate that by actually having an ensemble of assimilations. Okay, so ESMWF now have a, an ensemble technique, which I think, was that operational which, last year, no? Two years ago now. Oh, time flies, am I mere? So these are all ways of actually having uh, different perturbations. And so these are, are quite different. This is really to account for your lack of precise information about the observations, whereas this is to try and account for the fact that uh, you want to really sample the, the entire space. Perturbations to model physics. Well, we can change the parameter settings. If you have, for example, a convection scheme, you might want to just change one parameter in that scheme. So it might be the entrainment rate. So you might run five forecasts that have all slightly different parameters for the entrainment rate. So climateprediction.net, that's the other extreme for climate prediction. That's how they created their ensemble. They had each climate forecast model was basically using a, a different set of parameters for the different parameterization schemes. So the actual uh, model was the same, it's just the actual parameters. 
Or you might want to use stochastic physics. So at its very simplest level, stochastic physics merely takes the output from the parameterizations, the convection scheme, the radiation scheme, and multiplies it by a random number on a patchwork. Just simply multiplies it by a random number between a half and one and a half. Your radiation says, I should be cooling 1K per day. You multiply it by a random number, it becomes 1.5K per day over a patch for a certain period of time. Again, there's a lot of research into ways of actually increasing the complexity uh, and, uh, should we say, justification of how you do this, perturbing the physics. Or you can combine both of these and actually introduce multi-model systems. So you have multiple centers with multiple models and you combine them. Now, I've put this in red because sometimes when people talk about multi-models, especially for the longer time scales, especially for climate, but also for the seasonal prediction, often people interpret differences between multi-model systems as being the uncertainty due to the model physics. Okay, that happens in climate a lot. You compare 10 different CMIP5 models and you say, this is the uncertainty, they're different. This is the uncertainty due to the model physics. It's not, it's also the initialization because all of these systems have different systems and different ways of setting up their initial conditions, different data assimilation systems. So you have to remember that when you look at multi-model systems, it's accounting for both initial condition uncertainty, but also model physics, not just the model physics. So it's important to emphasize. So on the top, I showed you an example of the, uh, basically, the ENSO plumes, just using the ECNWF system. Okay, on the bottom here, this is a much thicker plume because this now contains four systems. It's from the EuroSIP, uh, basically multi-model system. Okay, so here I've, I've basically listed, and we're going to talk in a little bit more detail about some of the databases out there, uh, which uh, have basically all been put together over the last, should we say, one to five years. So in a way, uh, I would say, that the NWP and sub-seasonal and seasonal prediction has lagged a little bit behind the climate change problem in a way. If you think the, the databases uh, for the CMIP process have been around for quite a long time now. And with CMIP 5, there was a big effort with Seymour to bring them into a standard format to make them much easier to use. Now we're catching up in the atmosphere. So, for example, uh, for the short to medium range, uh, there's TIGI that's been around for a number of years now, uh, based at ECMWF, that uh, Frederick mentioned already. Okay. For seasonal forecasts, uh, there's EuroSIP, uh, which is a combination of four modeling systems, ECMWF, Meta France, Met Office, and NCEP recently joined them. Um, at the moment, it's only available online as graphical products, but I, I believe under Copernicus it will become open source with digital products as well. So the reason why I've included this is though it's not digitally open at the moment, it will be in the near future. So watch this space under the new EU-funded Copernicus program, which is the climate services side, is actually based at ESMWF in Reading. Okay. Uh, there's also the North American Multimodel Ensemble, NMME. How many of you have heard of this or used this just out of interest? So there's quite a few, six or seven of you. So again, this is focused on the, the seasonal forecasting time scale, and I have a slide in a moment showing some of the centers that contribute to that. And then there's CHFP. How many of you have heard of CHFP? Okay, those of you at IRI involved to it less. Okay, that's interesting. So that's something that's come out of one of the working groups, uh, WG SIP, that's focusing on the uh, basically sub-seasonal to interannual predictability. And this is a database which actually uh, tries to accumulate the hindcast suite, which I'm going to talk about in a moment uh, in one location. So one can document how seasonal forecasting systems have improved over time. It's supposed to be a, a long-term archive. archive. <laughs> okay. And then here in the middle, as I said, we have the sub-seasonal. So the S2S database uh, at ESIMWF, which is the one we're really going to focus on that's just come out this year. So NNME, I think, went operational in 2014. Uh, CHFP has been around for a couple of years. As I said, EuroSIP is not online yet. 
So this is all really in the last few years. I think Tiggy was perhaps a bit long. How long has Tiggy been around for now? Four or five? Or, yeah, about five, five years. Okay. Oh, 2005. Okay, yeah, a bit longer then. Okay. So that's been around for research. And then um, there is actually plans to actually uh, supplement the NMME with additional higher, res, uh, higher resolution forecasts on the sub-seasonal timescale as well which I believe is uh, penciled in for 2016 as well. So there will be a, a second uh, database that complements the S2S database at East WF, which is focused um, uh, more on the, the American systems uh, that's coming up in 2016. Okay. Now, I hope I haven't forgotten anything from that list that I should have included. Uh, feel free to interject if I have. Okay. So it's quite exciting at the, at the moment because we really, you know, in the last couple of years, we've got all of these uh, sources of information where we can look at uh, how these systems are working, the predictability in them, that just weren't there just a few years ago, essentially. So this is an example from the NMME from uh, Ben Kirkman's paper that came out just last year in BAMS showing the, the, the ENSO plumes, uh, and the red line is how the... the the, the, the model ensemble as a whole is doing compared to the black line, which is the observations. And these are the modeling systems that contribute to that. Okay. Just to mark um, the IRI, we've got some people from IRI, of course, that are helping us out here. Their system has got a star because that's no longer operational. And that's one of the things about these databases is, um, you know, do you have it that's purely operational groups or do you open it to a wider community uh, of research models as well? So. The slight difference in strategy between, for example, the S2S database and perhaps the NNME and uh, the others is that this has a mix of operational and research models, okay, whereas the S2S is purely operational centers, as you saw, which does mean that you've got a, perhaps a, a wider ensemble here, but you have systems that might not be sustained. It would change over time. So, for example, these two systems now are no longer operational. Okay. So if we go back to my simple schematic of this forecast, we have these cluster of solutions. So we, we could look at a, a, a root mean square error difference between all of these different forecasts. And we refer to that usually as the ensemble spread. Okay. So it's not what you put on your toast at breakfast time. Okay. Your spread is uh, basically a root mean squared error difference. Okay between all of these forecasts. Now, how big should your spread be? Remember, your spread is telling you your confidence. So if you have a very small spread, your forecasts are very similar. So maybe you're very confident. Tomorrow I think it's going to be 10 degrees, plus or minus a half. Maybe the next day your forecast for the day after is 10 degrees, plus or minus five. So you're not very confident. But if you set up your ensemble, how big should this spread be? Rhetorical question, maybe, but what should it be roughly equal to? Should be less. Does everybody agree with him? I would say you don't want it less than the error. What, what do you think? I mean, I would say, I kind of agree with you, but I think it should be on the same order of magnitude as the error. Okay, not less than the error. So, I mean, essentially, again, you, you want roughly the, the, the spread of the ensemble is roughly the same as your, your RMS error. So if this is my observation, you want that observation to kind of be in that cluster. Okay. So if your observed state always lies outside your cluster, that means that you think your modeling system is much better than it is. So you say, okay, I think in three weeks' time it's going to be 10 plus or minus 2, and then it's 5 or it's 15 or so on. So you don't want your observed state to be out here. You don't want the spread to be less than the RMS because that means you have an overconfident system. Okay. Likewise, if your observed state is always near the ensemble mean, and you've got this huge spread, that means that you're, you're, you're perturbing your initial condition perturbations and your model physics perturbations 
are agitating the system too much. Okay. So then you have an underconfidence system. You're giving people error bars that are too large. You're saying, well, you know, more or less, I think it's 10 plus or minus, you know, 5 degrees tomorrow. But in fact, your system's always within 0.5 or so. Okay. So you don't, you don't want to be doing that either because you're basically throwing information away. Okay. So you want your spread to be roughly of the same order of magnitude as your RMS error. Now, that sounds simple, but it's not as simple as it seems. Why not? Say again? Well, if you have an NWP system, the nice thing about uh, S2S timescales and, and so on is that you can look at your handcast, which I'm going to go into in a moment, over the past, and you can evaluate your model. So why, why is this not as simple as it seems? Because you could say, okay, I'm, I'm looking at tomorrow's weather, and say my spread is too large, always. Well, I've just tuned down my perturbations, make my perturbations a bit smaller, and then not perturb the model. And I reduce the spread until I get it just right. Everyone's happy, yes? But why is it not as simple as that? Okay, so... Very good. So you can't do this just for one particular day. Yeah, you have to average it over the statistics of a, a lot of forecast, which may be regime dependent. Okay, so you might find in certain regimes you're always overconfident, in others you're underconfident. Also, your spread behavior will be a function of lead time, location, and variable. Okay. So you might be looking at, for example, now I'm going to show an example in a moment where the, the Met Office have been trying to predict ENSO for the season ahead at lead times of you know, three, four months or even longer. And they find that their system is underconfident. But they maybe be able to adjust that, but they might find then that their, their predictions for other variables are overconfident. So it's not that you can just tune the system for one particular kind of forecast. It depends on what variable you're focused on, what your location is. So one of the, um, I should have put a slide in to demonstrate it, but one, uh, and now these days it's improved, but when I was at ECMWF 10 years ago, one of the key problems was the spread in the mid-latitudes looked nice in the medium range out to the month. So they had this, the, the forecast ensemble nicely spread out, but in the tropics, the system was overconfident. And it was very difficult to make changes to the system that made the tropics forecasts diverge enough to account for the error without having the mid-latitudes spread out too quickly. So you had this disparity between the behavior in the tropics and the mid-latitudes. So it's not that simple. It sounds like a very simple thing to fix and tune, but it really depends on your lead time, on your area that you're focusing on, and so on. So this was that example I wanted to show from the Met Office where uh, essentially, they're looking at uh, ensemble skill at predicting the NAO. And this is this black line here. And this is just of the, the number of members in the ensemble. But don't worry about that for the moment. The thing I wanted to show, this was uh, uh, shown in a talk last week by Doug Smith, was when they actually looked at the model predicting itself. So that means if they pretend that one of the 20 members is actually the truth, and they look at how well the other members predict that member, okay, they find that the, the prediction is much less skillful. So their interpretation, he said, was, well, they were thinking maybe that's a, a sign that the, the system is basically um, underconfident. Okay. And again, I was surprised that they hadn't gone away and just looked at this kind of diagnostic, just simply compared the RMS error of, against the ensemble spread, which, again, I think is why it's important to emphasize this. They hadn't done that, but I think this is just another way of showing that, that their, their ensemble for that particular metric uh, is actually underconfident. There's too much variation between the ensemble members. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about how one uses the forecasts um, and the, the variability. So a very simple example. We imagine we start from our perturbations, initial conditions, and we look at our, 
are basically our, our different forecasts for a certain future time. We might be looking at a, a certain event. So I've just got rain, no rain to keep it simple for S2S. Next week, we're going to be looking at, for example, prediction of drought occurrence or flood, an extreme flood. So the time range is uh, basically, um, should we say, generic here. How would we actually validate this? So if I say tomorrow, um, I think, so 70% of my forecasts say it's going to rain and 30 say it's not going to rain. If it rains, is that a good forecast? If I say tomorrow, 70% chance of rain, how many of you bring your umbrella? Quite a few of you. That's because the cost of bringing the umbrella is basically zero. It's a little bit of weight. Now, if you had to go and buy an umbrella, that starts to change it a little bit. You know, you've got to buy an umbrella for 50 euros. How many of you would buy an umbrella for 50 euros if I gave you a 70% chance of rain forecast? No, not many, no? <laughs> because your loss in that case is quite small. You get a little bit wet. Okay, so most of you would rather keep the 50 euros and spend it on something else, yeah? So this is why, so how would we actually validate that? If it doesn't rain tomorrow, how many of you would be cross with me? Oh, those forecasts are never right. I say it's 70% chance of rain and it doesn't rain. Am I right or am I wrong? How many of you think I'm right? No, oh, one, thank you. <laughs> My friend in the front row. How many of you think I'm wrong? Nobody, you're all very shy. Well, I just gave you a probability, so I mean, I can't be wrong. No, as long as I say, as long as I don't say zero, I mean, I can hedge my bets. I could just say every day, 50% chance of rain, and I'm always going to be right, yeah? But it's not very useful, is it? So how do you test that system? Well, basically, you have to look at many of my forecasts. So you say, okay, let's look at Tonkin's uh, forecasts over the last year. Let's look at all of the times he said 70% chance of rain. How often should it have rained? 70% of the time. Okay. If it rained all of the time, I've been underconfident. It comes back to that cluster of points. Okay. It means I've been underconfident. So when we talk about how to validate this, we're not going to do just thinking about ensemble means this week. We have to start to also think probabilistically. And that's important when you get along the beyond the, the deterministic range, okay? So I know it's a very, it's a little bit of a, a silly example in a way because it's very simplistic, but it's important to start thinking about that when we look at these products, okay, on the longer ranges. Okay, so I've got a few more slides. I'm in danger of overrunning here to start to introduce some of these systems. So um, I just wanted to put a little bit of uh, framework into place. I'm going to show the ESMWF system and the Met Office system, not all of the systems because it would be tedious and I'm not so familiar anyway with the other systems. If you're interested, we can find out this week about all the nitty gritty and, and, uh, and so on. So you know, at the top end, the, the, we have this deterministic run, which is the highest resolution system. We have a single forecast, okay? Now, ESMWF for quite a long while has been supplementing that they started with a, an ensemble run that was running out for 15 days, and that was many different forecasts to try and account for this model and uh, initial condition uncertainty by perturbing the initial conditions and perturbing the model physics. Then, basically almost two decades ago, they started to supplement that with a system which was basically looking at uh, seasonal forecasting timescales, okay? So we have the highest resolution. The ensemble was lower resolution because you're running 50 or 51 of these things. So it's a lot of computing power. So they have to run at lower resolution. The seasonal forecast was running at even lower resolution because this thing is running out for many months in advance. Okay. Uh, some of a subset of those were extended. Uh, is this still four times a year now? Yeah. So it's out of 13 months. Okay. So they run each month for seven months, but four times a year they run out for 13 months ahead. But you can see we've got a little bit of a gap here. Okay, that's what that, that bridging the gap is all about that Frederick was talking about this morning. So it started off, Frederick uh, was basically, I mean, if I understand correctly, you pretty much put the whole thing together yourself, no? Back in uh, yeah, 2003. So Frederick... Uh, 
you know, while he, when he had a, a spare moment here and a spare moment there, I remember at the time, uh, it was like on top of everything else he was doing, started to put this system together, which was basically sitting at an intermediate resolution between these two. And at that time, the research mode basically ran once per week for 32 days. If I get any of this wrong, you step in and tell me, yeah? Okay, so it was running 32 days, and it was run the system once per week. So had this, like, burst ensemble, okay? Once that went operational, there was a, a decision to basically try and, and bring these together, a little bit in a similar way that mimics what's done with the seasonal system, okay? So the ensemble now is essentially extended out to 48 days, not 32 days, okay? Um, and it's actually operated now twice per week. Okay, so you essentially have this, and it's uh, split resolutions. So you have a higher resolution at first, and it switches to a lower resolution for the extended run. Okay. One of the key differences, and I'm going to talk about this in a couple of slides time, is the hindcasts. I'm going to talk about why we need hindcasts in a moment first. So just to flag, there's a big difference between these systems in the fact that here we have dynamic hindcasts, here we have fixed hindcasts. So I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I just wanted to flag it now. And both of these systems at the moment have 51 members. Okay. So this is what, uh, now I wanted to come back to this forecast. So this blue line is showing this very high resolution, for example, system run here. These bars are showing the ensemble for the EPS. So you can see that this lead time I'm only showing here just basically goes out to 10 days. But these barred forecasts are carrying on now twice per week right out across the blackboard to day 48, which is somewhere over there. Okay? So that's how that fits in. The red line is the control, which essentially, what does that mean? It's essentially the basic forecast system without any perturbations. Okay. Now, I actually personally think that uh, if I became director of ESMWF, I wouldn't do this anymore because I'm, I'm, I don't like personally the way that you have a system where you have perturbations and then you have one forecast system that doesn't have perturbations because the modeling system is not the same. And that makes it very, very difficult. It's quite a constraint on your stochastic physics because what it means is anything you do in a stochastic sense has to have a zero mean perturbation. You can't have, if you try and do anything that doesn't have a zero mean perturbation, it means then you start getting into all sorts of trouble because your unperturbed system has a different set of physics to your perturbed system. And it's very difficult to keep the control inside your PDF. Okay. So I said the talk was a bit basic. That's in brackets for the <laughs> people that are slightly more into stochastic physics and perturbations. Don't, don't worry if that's uh, confusing. Just ignore me, okay? Switch off. Switch back on again now. Okay? Okay. Um, so you can combine these two. So next week, if I show you the health system, what we've done there, for example, for a health modeling system, is we've actually taken, and we need to upgrade this now to the 48-day, we take the 32-day, because we were looking when the older system once per week, we take the 32-day system for month one, and then we combine that, supplement it for months two to four with the seasonal forecasting system, calibrate, and then use that to run the applications model. So if, if we find that there's a uh, call or interest for that, I will show that at the end of next week. Okay. So why would we do this? Why do I combine that? Well, one of the reasons, of course, is the resolution. We've talked about the higher resolution. Okay. And if, um, if we look... What I'm showing here this is just, uh, just a simple correlation map of the temperatures. I'm interested in Africa, so I'm showing Africa on the left. The right panel is showing the increase in skill of using the sub-seasonal system, the extended EPS, for 32 days compared to the seasonal system. And this is exactly like for like. So what I'm doing is if the... Uh, if the because, of course, the one thing that's difficult comparing these systems is they start at different times. The seasonal system starts on the first day of each month, okay? And the, uh, as we said, the uh, sub-seasonal system starts twice per week. So I think it's, is it Monday and Thursday, yes, if I remember rightly? So every Monday and Thursday. So I'm, I'm comparing exactly like with like. If I have a forecast, 
that starts on Tuesday, the 10th of March, and runs for 32 days. I take those exact 32 days predicted from the seasonal forecast that starts on the 1st of March. Okay? So it's exactly the same days for a whole year's set of uh, forecasts and hindcasts. Okay. So where does this skill advantage come to, from? Let's see. That's right. You will have some variability in some areas. I mean, just from uh, chance, you wouldn't expect to have zero everywhere. So there, are, there will be some sampling issue there. Um, and you might find that there are some aspects of the system that actually gives you detriments or so on. But on the whole, if you average it, you have a, an advantage in skill. Yeah. So where would the advantage or difference, because there is actually a point. I'm gonna, isn't, no, it's an important question you made, because there, is, you know, there are some things that, that may not necessarily be an improvement. Let's see how many of you have been listening so far to my basic lecture. So where is this going to come from? I've told you one already, resolution. What else do we expect to have a skill advantage when I'm looking at, this is a year's worth of forecast plus all the hindcasts of the S2S system compared to the seasonal system? The way you're initializing is different, actually. And that's one of the reasons where uh, it could be better, but sometimes you could get worse because the seasonal system, actually, they have a longer time before they issue the forecast, whereas the twice-per-week forecast, you don't have the time to do, for example, all of the things with the ocean. So uh, Frederick would be talking about the way the oceans initialize, but you have to have a system that's a little bit faster, so you blow winds uh, across, is that right, the, the ocean to get the ocean perturbed state, which could be worse, could be better. Uh, you know, you have to look at that systematically. So because of your fast lead time, there could be things that are actually detrimental with the monthly system because you've got to get the forecast out quicker. It's no good waiting 15 days like you do with the seasonal forecast because it's twice per week. It'll be too late. Very good. Any, any other ideas? Different time scale? But these are exactly the same uh, dates. I think I don't know what you're getting at. So you're talking about the different start times or the, the different time scales? Because I'm looking at the same 32 days. So the seasonal is the first 32 days of the seasonal. So I'm not looking at different, uh, should we say, I'm not looking at the whole four months of the seasonal. But you are, the answer is the right answer, but for a different reasons. I was, I was kind of elucidating to earlier. It's the lead time advantage sounds like a really stupid thing, but your seasonal forecast is once per month. Your S2S is updated twice per week. So if on the 1st of March you make a forecast, well, they both start at the same time. But say I'm, I'm, I'm running operationally for, for my case, malaria in Uganda, I can continue to update it. So when it gets to the 28th of March, I can use the most recent S2S. And it's almost a whole month newer than the most recent seasonal forecasting system. So it sounds a complete banality, but it's something that's very important. Filling that gap is not really so much about the resolution. The biggest advantage you've got is that you have a system that's much more frequently updated, but goes out to 48 days. Okay. So you have a lead time advantage. Okay. So you have a lead time ad advantage. That's your biggest key step, in fact. Okay. You have a framework advantage. You've got the ability to have more computing power spent, so higher resolution. You have also, there are other differences in initialization. And then there's a middle one, which I'm going to come to now. You have basically your physics. Now, what do I mean by that? The, and it comes back to these fixed hindcasts. I'm going to come back to this point in just a second. So I have a few more slides, and then I'm going to wrap up. So, so this just hindcast, just in case I've confused somebody. Um, why do we need hindcast? Well, imagine this is evolution of some variable forward in time, and this is the real world, real world. So this could just be temperature. And this is my forecast. So maybe I have a forecast here. Uh, normally it's 10 degrees. I forecast 8. So that means we're 2 degrees colder than usual. Okay. But of course, these models have biases. So this might be my model world. Okay. So my forecast is warmer than the model world, so we have to basically translate this 
anomaly onto the real world. This is just a very simple case of bias correction. Of course, I've actually drawn both lines identical. I mean, the real, the real model world, we had the real world, the model world, and then the real model world is that all your variance and everything else is going to be different as well, which means that bias correction as well is not uh, as easy as it seems. Uh, we could have a whole, and we have done actually, a whole workshop on bias correction techniques. Uh, so you need to have hindcasts for the past to be able to calibrate your model. Okay. So how is that done? Well, let's introduce, first of all, another modeling system. Okay. This is quite a complicated diagram. It's from a paper that just came out this year in QJ from the Met Office system. So they have a slightly different way of doing things. They actually have each day four forecasts two which extend right out for seasonal timescales, and two which only extend for sub-seasonal timescales. And they do this every day. So in a week, they've got seven sets of these. Seven times four, 28. Okay? And then for a month, you, they'll take three weeks' worth of these forecasts. So, and they combine that together to get their, uh, their basically, their, their forecast set. So their S2S product uses seven days of these four forecasts to give you an ensemble of 28 days. Okay. So the difference in that, how is it different? Well, you can see, again, it, it comes back also to this lead time. Okay. If ECMWF has a burst of 50 forecasts on a Monday, then your information for Tuesday is going to be nice. You've got a lot of ensemble members. Okay. For that Tuesday with the, with the, uh, the, the Met Office forecast, Four of those forecasts would have been made six days earlier. Okay, so there'll be much older information. But of course, if you then look a couple of days later for the ECMWF, if you look on the Wednesday, then you won't have any information newer than two days. Whereas the Met Office will always have some of these, which are just one day old. So their system has a, a very continuous, uh, should we say, lead in time. Whereas the ECMWF is a, a little bit like a sawtooth. You know, each twice per week you have a burst of information which then decays in terms of its, uh, its how new it is. So, again, it's different strategies of how to set this up. And they also have a, a dynamic uh, hindcast suite. So, just to make sure, I put this in just before, because after Frederick talked about on the fly and fixed, I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood what that meant. So I just added this very quickly. It's why it's a little bit... Um, of a rubbish picture. That's all I could manage right, over coffee break this morning because I wanted to make sure that was clear. So what do we mean by on the fly? What it means is, okay, this is my forecast ensemble, 50 members, which I'm doing now, today. Okay, so the date today is, what is the date today? 22nd? Oh, 23rd, yeah? Okay. Now you can see why I arrived 20 seconds before the start. <laughs> okay, so today's the 23rd of November and we make a forecast. Okay, so the Dynamical on the fly hindcast says, okay, let's also make an ensemble for the same day for the last 23 years, or sorry, the last uh, 20 years, excuse me. It used to be 18 and now it's extended to 20 years. Am I right? Okay, good. So, so it's now recently changed, it's the last 20 years. So you say, okay, let's also start for the 23rd of November 2014, 23rd of November 2013, 12, all the way back for the last 20 years. Okay, so you don't just run the forecast now, you run that every single time also for the last 20 years for exactly the same date. Okay, so that's a kind of dynamical system. By contrast, you might have a fixed system that says, okay, we have our new system, new model, let's run a whole load of hindcasts and then we'll forget about it. That's my database of hindcasts. So no matter where my forecast starts, you might run hindcasts for the last 18 years, maybe starting every single day, I don't know. Um, but, but you run this hindcast suite, and then it stays fixed in time. Okay. Why would you use one or the other? Well, it depends on a number of factors. And the key one is how often are you updating your system? Okay. Now, for example, the seasonal forecast system at ECMWF is not updated as often as the others on the order of every four to five years. A little bit like climate modeling systems. You know, they, 
each modeling center tends to have a new system for each IPCC report, but then they use that system for the next four or five years. If your modeling system stays the same, then you might go for something like this, because for the next four or five years, your model physics are not changing. So you can run all these and then freeze them. What's the advantage of doing that? Well, because you just do it once, you can perhaps have your hindcast suite with more members. Okay. So you have a larger ensemble to sample your uncertainty. Okay. However, if you have an NWP system that's updating quite frequently, so on average, it's been a little bit less often recently, but ECMWF uh, will update their system two or three times a year. Why? Well, there might be new satellites that come online that you want to incorporate into your data assimilation system. There might be new fo model physics updates that improve your forecast quality and so on. And you want to bring them online as quickly as possible. You don't want to wait five years before you start using a satellite. Probably the satellite won't be there anymore in five years' time. They have a five-year lifetime. So if your system's updating all the time, you don't have that much advantage to do this. So you really want to basically, each time you have a forecast, redo those uh, hindcasts to make sure you're always using the same modeling system because it's no point having a hindcast with a different model because it'll have different bias characteristics. Okay. The bad thing, of course, though, is it makes it more expensive to run, which means it hits your ensemble size. If you didn't have to do this each time, instead of 50 members, you might be able to afford 100 members here or even more. Okay. So the system used to have just five members per year, which has been increased now, but it used to be just five members per year for the ESMWF system. So as Frederick showed you, different centers have different methods. So a lot of the, the centers that perhaps update the model less frequency are using this fixed methodology rather than the dynamic. It also means that the database construction was a little bit more complicated due to this disparity between the centers. It made it more difficult to have a generic interface. It also means when you want to look, for example, say you want to look at the NAO predictability, how do you do it? Well, we could take the operational forecast. The, 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 the system at ESMWF has been running from 2008. Okay. So if you wanted to look for a few years, you could look at the interannual, uh, should we say, changes in the predictions using the actual operational forecast ensemble. But the problem is that that model is changing all the time. There are updates to the system, so it's not a coherent system. So what one tends to do is, for any particular start date, is actually use the hindcast. So this is year minus one, year minus two, three, four, down to 20 years or beyond to look at the interannual variability. So I just wanted to emphasize that because that can also sometimes cause some confusion that you actually have two time axes because you can look at the operational forecasts and how they change in time, but then the model version is changing. Or you can look at the hindcast suite, but then you have a smaller ensemble size. So the malaria work I was showing was just based on five members. Okay. So, it also, by using that hindcast suite again, I mean, you're restricted to the length of the database um, range. And as I said, this particular work, we only had five members in the hindcast suite, whereas the operational system, of course, has 51 members. As time goes on, you're adding more and more operational cycles, you're going forward in time. So, as I said, it's been around since 2008. So, it does make it a little bit more tricky, as I said, to set up the database. You'll notice, for example, for the NNME that the hindcasts are all fixed and they're all roughly covering the same period, which does make it easier to intercompare these systems. Uh, that's not necessary to the case for things such as S2S, where you have dynamic hindcasts are moving forward in time, so your oldest years are actually dropping off. If you look at the system in 2015, you won't have the same set of years as the system had for 2012. Okay. So I'm going to stop there. Sorry, I've run overrun it actually by 10 minutes. Okay. Apologies. Um, and as I said, in the afternoon, uh, Frederick is going to show some of just a quick demonstration uh, of some of the aspects of the S2S, and I will be showing uh, a similar thing in parallel for the reanalysis and so on. Okay. Stop there. Thank you.